Boxing is a business. Any business is associated with the redistribution of material and human resources. And where there are resources, there are always those who want to own them. It is this way now as it was 100 years ago. In modern boxing, there are managers and promotional companies. These people organize fights and promote the boxers. For their services, they take a percentage of the profits per duel. Businesses often ignore morality. They serve only as a way to make money. Everyone does what he does to be better than the rest. In the modern version of the promotional business, we are witnessing a struggle for a place in the sun. Each organization seeks to sign a contract with a talented and high-class boxer in order to further earn money from his victories. This is an analogy of feudal fragmentation, where power is distributed between many promotional companies. This is in contrast to the 1950s when power was consolidated under a single entity, the International Boxing Club. Formerly, the IBC was an independent company that was responsible for organizing championship and contender fights, as well as broadcasting big boxing events. But in fact, the organization was headed by four leaders, the godfathers of the ring. This mafia controlled all the events of professional boxing with an iron grip and ruined more than a dozen human lives. Who are these four most influential personalities in the world of professional boxing? And how did their fates turn out? This is what we will explore in today's video. Today's betting operations are small compared to the scale of activities of one James Dugan Norris, or simply James Norris the main tycoon of the betting business in the mid-20th century. This man controlled all sports, from equestrian to the National Hockey League. Jimmy was not just a gambler. It was he who created the IBC in 1949 and took the position of chief director. Norris performed official functions, sharing small pieces of the action with his friends. But how did he create an organization that brought under its control all of professional boxing? As with any system of political paradigm, there are no random people at the head of the leading promotional companies. Norris came to power by removing the former leader, Mike Jacobs. Officially, Mike died of a stroke in 1953. In 1949, Jacobs, being the main power in the promotional business in the 30s and 40s, unexpectedly sold his company to the 20th Century Sporting Club for a symbolic $150,000 and renounced the right to organize fights in the mecca of boxing pros, Madison Square Garden. Mike quickly went into the shadows, and after a couple years, he died, allegedly from a stroke. All rights to organize fights were received by the then unknown, just created IBC organization. It is the survival of the fittest, the law of the jungle. The second actor and main think tank of the IBC was Truman Gibson, a lawyer, political scientist, orator, and ardent fighter for the rights of blacks, a professional military man, a former prisoner, a man of his character could not go unnoticed by Jim Norris. He recruited Gibson. With his help, all legal and near boxing issues were resolved with one stroke of the pen. Like any man, Truman had his weaknesses. Getting drunk was a common thing in the Sunday pastime of the IBC general manager. Norris turned a blind eye to the personal activities of his lawyer. And to keep Gibson out of harm's way, during his weekend entertainment, 24-hour security was assigned to him. The third important person in IBC was Frank Palermo, nicknamed Blinky. One of the most brutal and merciless gangsters in New York, Palermo was cold-blooded and efficient, fulfilling any order to the letter. His ruthlessness was the key to his high status in the complex gangster hierarchy in the 1950s. He was loyal only to one person, his master and patron, Paul John Carbo, better known as Frankie Carbo. Without Palermo, Norris would have never been able to crush the entire world of boxing. However, it was Frankie Carbo who was at the head of the godfathers of the ring. 
Issues were resolved on the behalf of Jim as the leader, but in fact, all boxing events took place under the strict control of Carbo. The great and terrible Frankie Carbo sat at his desk in the superbly stylish Toot Shore Bar on Manhattan Street and he decided the fate of the best boxers in the world. He, through Norris, controlled almost all the championship fights. Between 1949 and 1955, 47 of the 51 championship bouts took place with the official permission of the IBC. Add to this all the fights for the title of mandatory contenders, and you have total control of the world of professional boxing in the hands of just four people. Unexpected refereeing decisions, the strange behavior of the fighters during the fight, the refusal of scheduled fights, all of this was controlled by Frankie, performed by Norris, formalized by Gibson, and the problems were solved by the hands of Palermo, a clear and well-designed scheme. For a long 10 years, the Mafia seized power in professional boxing. The influence of the Mafia in professional boxing also had positive aspects. Business proceeded smoothly, there was no modern feudal fragmentation and problems with organizing fights. One champion, one contender, one title, one broadcast channel of the fight. However, who is the champion, who is the contender, and who will own the title was also decided by a narrow circle of people. Those who did not follow the dictates of the IBC experienced severe punishment. The famous Custimato didn't want to make an agreement with the IBC. His fight against the Mafia almost led to fatal consequences. There were two assassination attempts on Cus. The war then subsided, then flared up again. IBC cut off D'Amato's fighters in the professional ring. In the end, Cus was forced to sell his boxing club, Gramercy Gym, for a symbolic price of one dollar and leave for a small town, Catskill, New York. Fortunately, the great mentor survived, but not everyone who disagreed was so lucky. Why did Carbo choose to focus on professional boxing? There were two main reasons for this. First, football, basketball, and baseball were poorly funded and did not cause as great a stir among the American public. A good boxer was valued at all times. Fight, blood, knockouts. This all awakened an ancient instinct of man. Thirst for a spectacle. A person will always pay attention to danger and threats. These moments are in boxing. The heavyweight champion received almost as much notoriety as the president. And where there was an audience, there was money. And where there was money, there was always Frankie Carbo. Second, ease of management. There are two fighters in a fight. Negotiating with one of them is not difficult, but both were often recruited. In football or baseball, dialogue is problematic. There are many people involved, and it is much more difficult to come to an agreement. It must be a collective decision. The more people, the more problems. The choice in favor of boxing is due to the naturalness of the situation. One fighter losing to another naturally happens. And it was easier to put on a performance when there are two participants, as opposed to when there are 22 participants. Who did put an end to the reign of the IBC? Kerry Estes Kefauver. Known in narrow circles under the pseudonym Nerd because of the thick glasses he wore and his habit of fastening the top buttons of his jacket and shirt. He was a lawyer and a politician, an ardent fighter against organized crime, a man obsessed with honesty and truth, which in the end prevented him from taking the highest positions in the government. However, it was his acumen and perseverance that brought the IBC's reign to an end. Carbo and his wildest imagination could not dream that his brilliant career would be ruined by such a person as Kefauver. Estes Kefauver's patience and perseverance were enviable. For many years he followed the activities of the IBC. He looked for a weak spot, communicated with the fighters, and tried not to fall into the hands of Blinky Palermo. He who seeks 
will always find. And in 1959, Kefauver found the same thread, a weak point that led to the collapse of the Mafia clan. At the end of 1958, the world welterweight title was won by a talented but unstable boxer, Don Jordan, when he knocked out the champion, Virgil Aikens. He repeated his success in a rematch with Aikens and confirmed his reputation. Aikens' defeat was an upset. Frankie Carbo didn't expect Aikens to lose to Jordan, and therefore he had not recruited Jordan's team in advance. Moreover, Truman Gibson had been assured that Jordan would not be a problem for Aikens. However, after the unexpected victories, Don and his manager, Don Nesset, flatly refused to cooperate with Carbo. The lives of the boxer and the manager were put in jeopardy. Nesset, fearing reprisal, turned to a local lawyer for help, who led him to Estes Kefauver. Kefauver masterfully took advantage of this breakthrough. The man who vouched for Don Jordan to Truman Gibson, a sly manager named Jackie Leonard, was mysteriously found dead in a ditch, just after the conflict between Nesset and Carbo. A three-month trial began. It was like a blockbuster. It was the forces of good, represented by Kefauver and Nesset, who fought the forces of evil, represented by the Carbo Group. For many years, Kefauver had been collecting clues and evidence of the IBC's illegal activities. All he needed was a final push. And that impetus was the victory of Don Jordan over Virgil Aikens. The court ruled. Frankie Carbo was sentenced to 25 years in Alcatraz, 15 years in prison for Blinky Palermo, and five years probation for IBC think tank Truman Gibson. The IBC ceased to exist. Following a lawsuit, the International Boxing Club was sealed off and later declared a subsidiary of Madison Square Garden. What happened to IBC President Jim Norris? On February 19, 1959, Jimmy, sensing something was wrong, sold his stake in the IBC and disappeared from the public eye. He turned over his management rights to Truman, which in turn led to Gibson receiving five years of probation. Norris had successfully invested in railroad stocks, which at the time was a trend on the stock exchange and lived happily off the revenue. He died in 1966 on a train in his compartment during a trip to Chicago. The official cause of death? Heart failure. However, as many eyewitnesses of those events claimed, Jimmy was helped to die by Carbo's henchmen, who could not forgive the former director of the IBC for his escape from justice and his betrayal of his associates. At the time of his death, he had $250 million in his bank account. Jimmy knew how to make money. In 1963, the Robin Hood of the trial, Estes Kefauver, also passed away. The official cause of his death, heart attack. However, as we have already found out, that is not always associated with poor health. In 1976, the legendary Frankie Carbo was released early from prison due to health problems. In November of the same year, he died in a clinic in Florida. His stay in the terrible Alcatraz prison broke the health of one of the most influential personalities in the world of professional boxing. His faithful subordinate, Blinky Palermo, served seven and a half years, his fourth prison term. After his release, Palermo was hired as a security guard for influential people and earned his living by intimidating people and extortion. Blinky knew no other life. He passed away in 1996. The good health of this hardened criminal could only be envied. He passed away at the age of 91. According to rumors after his death, seven bullets were found in his body. He spent a total of over 20 years in prison during his life. Until the end of his days, he trained in the gym and was devilishly strong. He was found dead in his own house. Presumably, he committed suicide. People like Palermo never just go away, nor do they forget those who have wronged them. In September of 1996, former world welterweight champion Don Jordan was beaten in a Los Angeles car park. The 61-year-old boxer fell into a coma. 
He later passed away on February 13, 1997. He died in the hospital without regaining consciousness. Eyewitnesses of the incident claimed that the elderly boxer was beaten by some old man. Thanks for watching the video, and if you liked it, please don't forget to press that like button, leave your comments, and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time in the ring.